Hey guys, it's Payne. I'm really excited to introduce a brand new show to Bet the Board that combines sports and alternative investing, the very first of its kind. Sports betting and collectibles converging is inevitable. Let me tell you why. Sports cards and memorabilia are another way to get money into the market and do it without limit restrictions or the substantial hold you're accustomed to with sports betting. Whether you collected cards as a kid and are looking to get back into the hobby, this podcast is for you. If you've been collecting cards for years, this podcast will make you think and operate more efficiently. Are you in real estate? The parallels to investing in sports cards and memorabilia are uncanny. You're on Wall Street. Well, listen close. The best sports cards have outperformed the S&P 500 by 6x since 2013. And during the 2008 market crash, sports cards held up better than the S&P 500. Bet the Board, in conjunction with PWCC, presents Cardboard Chat, an entertaining, sophisticated, and informative podcast that combines sports, analytics, betting, cards, and memorabilia. Without further ado, this is Cardboard Chat, with Jesse Craig, a leading figure in the collectible space, and me, Payne. The overwhelming support for this show after just two episodes has been amazing and flattering. And Jesse, typically people will dip their toes in the water and listen to the first episode to see what something is. And then there's this natural trail off. But episode two, up more than 20% from the inaugural episode and kind of thinking back to what we've created and getting some feedback, I completely understand that all we've discussed is five and six figure cards. And that can be a little <laughs> bit, you know, intimidating. And those sure. cards make up a small percentage of the collectors that can play in that sandbox. So I go back to when I first returned to the space and realized how overwhelmed I was. So for many of our listeners starting from scratch or reacclimating to the space, what are some things they can do or places they can search to gain more knowledge and be better informed to where they're comfortable buying and trading? Yeah, you know, um, it, it is flattering to get the feedback that we've gotten. And I totally get that we have probably talked over the heads of some of the listeners that don't understand the depths of the space. It's it's kind of nuanced. It's kind of interesting. Um, so obviously, the longer you're in it, the more you understand it. And sometimes even myself, like I'll, I'll talk about something and don't realize that it's just so ingrained in me that someone else might not understand. Um, so I actually had to do a little bit of research to try to find <laughs> a, uh, a good beginner's guide for the audience to check out if you're not familiar with our space. So um, I actually found one that is very in-depth and I was pretty impressed that these guys put it together. I have no affiliation with these guys. I haven't even, I hadn't heard of them before this, but um, there's a website called Hobby Lark. And if you just type in Hobby Lark collecting cards uh, on Google, there is a link for a beginner's guide to buying, selling, and trading uh, baseball cards. And obviously the baseball cards will apply to other sports, but um, it's a really good in-depth guide to kind of get the nuts and the bolts of the space down. Now, I want to be clear on something here. You know, depending on what you're really looking to get out of this, you know, out of this space, is going to determine how much time you put into it. Um, you know, this isn't a space to get rich quick, right? If you you wanted that, then, uh, you know, you missed your boat in 2020 when the pandemic hit. You know, everyone could probably close their eyes and make a little <laughs> bit of money the last couple of years, but uh, that is not the world that we live in anymore. So this really boils down to if you want to collect and, you know, you're going to focus on things that you love more, players you love, cards you find aesthetically pleasing, or if you're going to be someone that's going to do a deep dive similar to, you know, what you guys do on Bet the Board, you and Todd do, um, and you're going to start really investing in in players uh, that you think have a lot of upside. So if you're going to go the investment route, you're you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to really really jump in off the deep end. I mean, there's a lot of nuances in our space from population reports, uh, you know, serial numbering, quality from an eye appeal perspective. There's just a lot of things that go into 
uh, the the market to be successful if you want to make money at it. If you want to have fun, collect, do stuff with your kids like that, then it's a little bit more of just, hey, buy what you like, you know, do a little bit of pricing research, don't overpay. Um, but yeah, I would I'd definitely suggest checking out that beginner's guide uh, via Hobby Lark because it's a really good one. I- I'm going to do that. And what's interesting is you hit on the word time and there is this theory of 10,000 hours, right? And it's essentially... Mm-hmm. putting the necessary time and effort into something before you're knowledgeable enough to become an expert. And I, I mean, I stumbled upon a YouTube video in late 2015, which kind of had me wanting to get back into things. But I, I did a year of research looking at data and comp specific sets and their importance. And you, to your point, there's so many ways to collect. And I think that's what's great about this because there's so many offshoots to fit collecting styles and personalities and passion But there's real money at play here. And we've seen this market grow so much. The entry points are more expensive, not necessarily what they were in 2021 of March. But, you know, I'm just looking at something like a Mahomes asset that I purchased in March of 2018. And that stuff was cheaper than what Davis Mills is going for now, which, you know, (laughs) paints that picture that you need to put some time in doing this. You need to put in your due diligence and research. And you mentioned a great website, which I was unfamiliar with, and I'm going to check out, but a partner of yours in Beckett, that was something where Mm -hmm. I would just go in there go to their search bar, see what cards my favorite players had available, and then search for them. And because I'm a baseball guy, to me, baseballcardpedia.com, that's run by a buddy that we both know in Rodney, that's one of my yeah. go-to places for, for baseball card information. So just about putting the time in there. And I, I think YouTube has become basically the college for all of us. So <laughs> search around yeah. for that. I think, look, if, if you put the time into it, the information's out there. Um, it's on, it's on the internet, you know, there's everything at your fingertips. It's a matter of figuring out exactly what you want to focus on and then going and finding it. Now, look, to be clear, there's bad information out there as well. So, you know, be careful if you hear, um, something, you know, different, uh, way different from one guy that seems to be too good to be true. That typically is. Um, if someone's telling you to buy a card, figure out why they're telling you to buy that card. Um, you know, general information I think is much more valuable than specific information because it can actually be construed as investment advice. The theme discussed here to start this podcast revolves around time. And this is the perfect time to get into some undervalued and overvalued assets. <laughs> Let's go, let's go, let's go. It's time, folks. That's right. We're going to discuss undervalued and overvalued cards, or maybe even some memorabilia assets, potentially some players. Is it time to buy, sell, or hold on to these assets or players? We'll give you some opinions and back it up. There's two cards that we're looking at today, and I'm going to let you go first. We're looking at a 2003 Topps Chrome Refractor LeBron James PSA 10. And I'm interested to get your thoughts on this because it's a wildly popular card. We've seen mm-hmm. the epic highs of this card, you know, 18 oh, yeah. months ago. Talk to us a little bit about why this makes your list of undervalued or overvalued. Well, last week we did just undervalued. So I thought I'd throw an overvalued in there. And you know, look, I, I don't want to knock the card too much because it is actually an important card. Um, you know, it's the first issue for Topps Chrome. Um, uh, it's an extremely beautiful card from, you know, aesthetically, but it's just, it's too expensive. <laughs> so when when I, when I made uh, my decision to use this card, it was, uh, you know, Friday, so a few days ago. And uh, we had just had one sell on our premier auction for about 50K. Yep. And since then, one actually closed for over the weekend for 39K. So I think they're kind of trending down a little bit. We'll see where they settle. Um, but, you know, the, there's 174 PSA 10s of this card. There's almost 700 of them graded with just PSA alone. Um, you know, it, like I said, it is an iconic brand um, for, for LeBron and a, a staple rookie. But there's also black. This is a non-numbered card. Um, there are black refractors, though, that are numbered out of 500. There are X fractors that are out of 220, I believe. And there are golds out of 50. 
So there's many options from this issue. Plus there's a base issue. There's just a top scrum base non-refractor. Um, so it, it just, there's a lot of availability for this card. And now people can make the argument, well, there's 300 and something Michael Jordan PSA 10s. Right. But yeah, in 1986, you don't have many options for a Michael Jordan rookie. You got the 86 Fleer card number 57, or you have his Fleer sticker. And that's it from 1986. So you look at 2003 and you have a slew of different brands of trading cards and rookies for LeBron James because he was, quote unquote, the chosen one coming out of high school. And so the manufacturing companies knew this and they <laughs> they sure made sure they had enough uh, inventory <laughs> to go around to the general public. Yeah. And, and here's what's interesting to me because I did a little research on this and there were four sales from March 2021 to April 2021 that all eclipsed 200,000 bucks. That was oh, yeah. the 30-day window of the new peak of this card space. And you mentioned the one you guys sold for 50K. And then we saw the little dip based upon the slow start of LeBron James and the Lakers for 39 grand. I do want to ask you, at some point the floor has got to be in here, right? And, and sure, I understand the temperature of the market. And I think over the next 18 months, all markets could be a little more volatile than we'd like. But this does feel like, and this is interesting to me because PWCC, Brent, yourself, kind of create things within this space that become adaptable and used further down the line. And this card feels like it fits your blue chip asset criteria. So I, I guess when I, I'm not pushing back, but I do want to ask, we're thinking about a premium brand like Topps Chrome. It's a refractor. Mm -hmm. Is this something where you feel the card is overvalued short term in the next 12 to 18 months? Or are you bearish on this card long term when we zoom out and look five, 10 years from now? No, not long term. Um, not, not, not long term at all. I think it's, it's short term. It's just, yep. it's too much. Like this feels more like a 20 K card to me, 25 K somewhere in that range. I think you're right. Um, so, so when I, you know, when I decided to pick this, it was about two X what I thought it should be worth. And that's why, and it's a, it's a very well known card. And I think I said, it's the first issue of tops Chrome, which is inaccurate. I think, uh, I, I meant just it's his, yeah, it's just his, uh, it's his rookie is, is what I meant to say. But, um, it, it's, it's a card that, obviously went to the moon. I mean, this card's selling for over 200K when there was over 170, you know, PSA 10s. And that's not including any graded by Beckett or SGC. So there's just, there's a lot of quantity out there for this card. It is a staple card. It's a great brand. But I just feel in this moment in time, it's it's too much based on the quantity that's available. Makes complete sense. And I would agree with that, certainly short term. Although long term, we'll see. Obviously, a card like this is very dependent on the overall market. Yep. One card that I am very interested in, and I've looked at it for years and just have never pulled the trigger, and it certainly bugs me now, but I think it's still undervalued, and I'm more of a singles and doubles hitter that views things 5, 10, 15, 20 years out, but I'm looking at the 2001 Bowman Chrome Refractor Albert Pujols autographed rookie to 500 copies, and there's just so much to like about this card. It's the big brand with Bowman Chrome. It's an action hitting photo. So it's got that old school vibe with borders, but it's a refractor. So it has that that new school shine that attracts some younger collectors and that that part of the demographic. But I think what's most important to me is Albert Pujols. It's his most popular standard rookie card, but it also comes with this limited print run of 500 copies, which are all hand numbered. It's the very first year Bowman Chrome had autographed base cards in the set. OK, so, you know, you're thinking big brand popular, first of its kind and limited. That feels like the perfect recipe for long term growth. But what's fun about this card is back in 2001, Bowman would insert these exchange cards into packs. So you had to pack pull the insert exchange card and then mail it in for redemption to get this Albert Pujols rookie card. And the deadline to redeem these was June 2003. So there is a 0% chance all 500 <laughs> of these Albert Pujols rookie cards were actually redeemed, and that makes it rarer than the serial numbering would indicate. And then you have the obvious factors, right? Albert Pujols now, just the second baseball player of all time to reach 700 home runs, 3,000 hits. 
It's mm-hmm. just Poulos and Hank Aaron. And I think long term, this is a viable investment. And and no doubt, there's there's noise surrounding all markets right now. But I think when you wake up in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, this card's going to outperform most of the stocks in your portfolio. And and Jesse, I know we kind of exchanged some texts and emails along the way. I know you wanted to discuss another particular of this card in the regards to the autograph and Pujols' penmanship. Yeah. So one thing about this card, and, and sometimes you have this for specific issues in the space, but the autograph is actually really difficult to get a 10 10 grade on. So for it to not have any smudging, any streaking, it have to be a beautiful, bold autograph. It's very difficult to find in this issue. I'm, I'm, I think it's literally what, one out of every seven or 10 copies you find a bold blue autograph on this one? Yeah, without streaking, Some, they're very difficult yeah, to locate. without streaking. And the premium yeah, diff- comes very, attached to the ones that do. 100%. So a Beck at 9.5 recently sold for about 45,000. And there's only 500 copies of this exist. Like you mentioned, not all of them have surfaced, um, let alone in a 9.5. It's it's also condition sensitive. But um, another thing to mention is hand numbering in our space carries a premium typically as well, because it's very aesthetically pleasing to see, you know, the hand numbering on a card versus just the stamp serial numbering and collectors uh, and investors seem to appreciate that more than just the standard stamping. Um, but, you know, there's not very many key rookies that were produced for Pujols in 2001 either. So this card, you know, we talk about 86 Flair for Jordan not having many options. It's kind of the same thing with Pujols in 2001 from a baseball perspective. There's just not – you got the SP. You know, you just don't have a ton of really key rookies even though it's 2001 for Pujols. So – the quantity available if you want to invest in a guy like him who is, you know, arguably a top 20 all-time player. He's a three-time NL MVP, two-time World Series champion. He's top 20 in war. Like you mentioned, you know, just him and, and Aaron have done the 700 home runs and 3,000 hits. Um, you know, and he's also was a great fielder, too. He's a two-time gold glove winner. So he's a stud. I mean, he is an absolute legend. Like I mentioned, a top 20 all-time player. And for his key rookie card – to be selling for only $45,000 when you kind of look at the macro picture that is our market, it just feels very undervalued. I I completely agree there. And what's interesting about that set is you have his counterpart in Ichiro. And that's an Mm -hmm. interesting card in and of itself because you have two very variations of that with the Japanese on the back and then you have the English version. But it's good to have that second card within that set kind of propelling things. But to your point, I think this is ultimately his best autograph. Now you have super collectors that may disagree, right? The chirography gold and things of that nature. But in terms of right. the popularity, the brand status, it's all there with this card. And, and to me, it's it's one that uh, I wish I would have purchased a while ago and one that I may look to to find here pretty soon. Yeah, if uh, if these settle down at all because of the macroeconomic you know world that we're in right now, I think that you should pull the trigger because I, I like this card long term. Speaking of pulling the trigger, this is a segment that has gotten a lot of notoriety on social media. <laughs> it's magic number time. Pick a number, any number, whatever it may be. We got a number inside, but we want a magic number. All right. This is where we're going to pick a few big cards that enter in an auction over the next couple of days. And we're going to try and guess how much they sell for in advance. Throw out a number. We got one too. All right. So I'm looking at the cards you sent this week. I very much live in the world of the first one the other two you're certainly throwing me into the deep end of the pool where you're michael phelps and i have no idea on some of these cards it required a lot of research over the last couple of hours here i'm going to start with the card that's a little bit more in my wheelhouse here and that is the 1909 t206 ty cobb red portrait tobacco card psa4 with great eye appeal and before we get to our evaluations of this card jesse You kind of want to talk about the importance of the vintage 1909 T206 set here? Yeah, for sure. Um, And I also want to mention that you started the segment again sandbagging because we have looked at the records so far and you were absolutely crushing me in the segment. So I don't I don't want to hear the fact that you've got some curveballs coming in the the magic number segment today. It's uh, it's only it's only fair. (laughs) (laughs) It's early. It's just the start, right? I mean, that's, right. We, that's it. That's right. Six cards, small sample size, a lot of variance within a small sample size. And and I feel like, you know, I looked at this and I said, 
and I don't want to spoil it and jump ahead too far, but there's a tennis card. And yeah. I said, whoa, this is going to require hey. some work. <laughs> you and me both. That's why I put it in there. <laughs> All right. Let's get back on task here with the uh, Ty Cobb Red Portrait. Right. So, yeah. So, 1909 T206, it's a really popular set for people to collect. Um, these are actually cards that are, you know, kind of skinny and tall. They were inserted in packs of tobacco back in the nineteen, the early 1900s. And um, it's, it's a really iconic uh, set because this is the set that the infamous Honus Wagner comes from. Now, Honus Wagner was against smoking tobacco and, um, you know, he found out they put his likeness on, uh, on these, these cards that were inserted in tobacco packs and threw a fit, made them destroy a bunch of them, but there's still, you know, roughly 60 some odd copies that have surfaced and exist. And these are the cards where even if they're graded on a scale of one to 10, only a one or a two, they're selling for two to $3 million because it is the staple chase card in our entire space, irrelevant of condition. doesn't matter. So... This card itself is a PSA 4. It has our PWCC A IPL sticker on it, which means that to the eye, it is very aesthetically pleasing. I mean, looking at this card right now, I have it pulled up on my computer. It's almost dead centered um, because these cards have, you know, like somewhat of a border to them. So the centering really matters when you're looking at it, especially for those like myself who are very symmetrical people. Um, you know, it's got great color. This card itself has, you know, kind of a red background, hence the red portrait. There's different variations of this card, um, but there's also different backs to these cards too. So there's some backs that are really, really, really rare. Um, and this one is a Piedmont back. Uh, like I said, it's a PSA 4 with an, a PWCC A IPL, which means it's in the top 30% of all examples that exist in PSA 4s, in our opinion. Um, love this copy. The last sale for a little bit lesser quality, in my opinion, was 11 k um, I'm going to go... 14.2 on this one. Oh, see, this is a little bit tough because with vintage, it's a little easier to get some market indicators. And I think you discussed this card perfectly. Now, Honus claims it was for the kids. Other people claim he was the biggest brand and wanted a little bit more money to be included in the set. But we will go with the optimistic viewpoint that he was trying to save the kids. Honus loves the kids, similar to Trick Daddy. Um, the interesting part about this card, and you mentioned all the different back variations, and, and there was three years of this, from 1909 to 1911. Ty Cobb does come with four variations on the front, and there were 16 different cigarette backs that were available. I, I like this one. I was somewhere in your same ballpark. I'm going to make this fair, and I'm going to kind of readjust my number here so there's a gap between us, and it makes a little bit. I was at 14.4. Let's just make it 14.8 <laughs> for the sake of this. And right. so there's a little bit of a gap. I'll, I'll go a, a touch higher. So I'll be at 14.8. You were what again? Uh, 14.2. Yes. Okay. So I'll create a little bit more of a gap just so it, it's it's fair for both of us. And, and there's ultimately a potential winner here if it lands somewhere in the middle. The second card is a complete polar opposite card. It's a modern day card. 2019 Panini Contenders Cracked Ice Ticket. Zion Williamson, rookie auto to 25 copies. It is the variation. And when we talk about some of these modern cards, there's just such a wide range of possibilities with all of the current market conditions. Obviously, modern players come with their own volatility. It's obvious that Zion went down with a little bit of a, a bump on Sunday evening. I think when you look at this, the injury doesn't seem severe, but it does cast the doubt in collectors' minds of Zion's ability to stay healthy with sure. his frame, with his size, the way he plays the game above the rim. Where are you going on a valuation for this interesting card? Mind you, there are two cracked ice variations with this one, I believe. Right. And I believe this is the less attractive of the two. You're correct. Um, the there was so there was a recent sale of the more attractive variation in a nine five, which this is also a nine five for twenty three K. Um I think he started off the year well. Not outstanding, not poor. Obviously, you know, he, he hurt his backside last night. Um, and we don't know, though, if he's going to be out for a little while or not. Now, this card closes in about six days. So depending on the news of the severity of that injury, it could be, you know, day to day with, you know, a, a bone bruise type of thing 
or maybe it's a, you know, they call it a contusion. So maybe it's longer, but, um, you know, this is a, it's an aesthetically pleasing, pleasing card. It's got an on-card autograph. Like we said, it's a Beckett nine, five. These are serial numbered out of 25. Uh, but there's two variations like we mentioned. So there's really 50 total. This is a lesser of the two. I'm going to go, I'm going to go 18, five on this one. Wow. Interesting. Okay. I am going to be a little bit lower on that. And to your point, I'm not quite sure how serious the injury might be. He's got a lot of padding on that backside, but to your point. A lot. (laughs) (laughs) The the word contusion got thrown around. And so is it day to day? Is he out at the time this auction ends? It's very interesting. I am actually at 15,800 on this one. So a little bit lower than you. And there could just be a wild result in terms of where this ultimately ends, where I think one of us could certainly look like a fool here. And it's probably me. Um, I look, if injury news comes out and he's out for an extended period of time, call it a week or two. Right, then I'm sipping the celebratory drink before this yeah, thing ends. Exactly. That's my. <laughs> that's kind of my point. Like, if he doesn't step on the court before this thing ends, I'm screwed. <laughs> Maybe I'll go with a, a sweet white wine because I'm very manly oh, in my God, celebratory drink. <laughs> can, we please get you, can we please get you on some Pinot? I mean, look, if you're going to have something like that, at least do some champagne for crying out loud. None of this, you know, Pinot Grigio crap. Champagne gives me headaches. I'm kind of week all right Good lord moving along here and this was my initial jab at you and throwing me into the deep end of the pool wow a 2020 net pro international series carlos alcaraz rookie patch auto to 50 copies in a psaa i don't own any tennis cards i don't follow tennis other than owning a percentage of a betting group's accounts. But the research that I've done for this specific card and the guys that I've talked to about this, apparently Carlos Alcaraz is one of the biggest up-and-coming potential stars, youngest ever to be the men's world number one player. He has many of the traits of some of the greats. He's won six ATP Tour singles titles, including the 2020 U.S. Open. He's in the spotlight because he plays all the tournaments and ultimately playing more than a guy like Joker has led him to be currently the world's number one singles tennis player as well. Yep, that's it. I want to hear your number first. I'm not giving you anything on this one. Well, this one's going to be tough. Yeah. And I think you're going to be higher than I am. And ultimately, that's going to cause a little bit of an interesting element here. So I've looked at this card. There was one that sold recently. It was in a BGS 9 with a 10 autograph, although the autograph's very similar. Just a little bit more lenient of a autograph greater. Now, the patch was better <laughs> on the other one. I'm going to come in substantially lower. So I want you to keep your true number here because this could create a massive okay. dichotomy. Sure. But I'm going to come in here... At eighty four hundred dollars. Okay, I'm lower than you. Really? Yeah. Yep. Wow, I'm stunned. I thought you would be higher on this card. Okay, here you go. So yes, reigning U.S. Open champion, number one player in the world. This is this card is the staple for tennis rookies. So if you are a gambling man and you're going to play the long term on Alcaraz, then this is the card you buy. Um, it is a PSA 8 with a 9 auto, so the auto is not as good. These are numbered out of 50. Now, Serena Williams' variation ha- looks identical to this that is a, a rookie card. They just they kind of remade. It's kind of like um, for de- uh, the 03 Exquisite, where they, in 2009, the last year they made it, they did uh, almost an homage to the the original 2003 designs. And so this is what this 2022 is an homage to the 2001 Serena Williams rookie. So a Serena Williams PSA seven with a ten auto, okay. Recently did thirteen thousand. You set me up. I knew it. I set you up. I set you up. <laughs> so, so what I will so, say is, go ahead. You finish. No, she. So and look. So when when looking at the, this is the reason that I settled the number I did because you talk about Serena unquestionably the goat in her sport, maybe the greatest female athlete of all time. And she has a PSA 7 with a 10 auto, which for those card people out there that understand this um, or, and those that don't, like I would much rather have a 7 with a 10 auto than an 8 with a 9 auto. Now, supply is half, right? This one's out of 50 when they remade these, and Serena's is out of 100. But 
Uh, I also don't think that Alcaraz has a very attractive autograph. It's basically a large C with a scribble inside of it. Yeah. So it's, you know, that, that does affect value on some of these guys, you know, some of these younger athletes. It's like they just don't don't give a shit about what their autograph looks like. So if we have a younger these, audience here, don't don't tell us about the old days. Um, how how kids d- just don't care. Hey. How they're all about TikTok. They're all about TikTok. I got kids. They're all about <laughs> TikTok. So it, it is true, though, that these, because of, I think, the the number of manufacturing that goes on and the, the, the amount of autographs that these guys are signing, speed when doing it is critical for them to get through everything. And I'm sure that their hands hurt like hell when they're done doing it. But a lot of younger guys are starting to autograph very, in a very lazy nature and for me, I really appreciate somebody that takes a little bit more time so I can at least get a, a letter with like a little scribble and a last uh, initial with a little scribble versus just a C. I completely agree. Now, here's did you give your price, by the way? Yeah, five three fifty. Five three fifty. This is interesting because I think there's an element here where we could fall somewhere in the middle. Now, you sent me this card. I looked at it. It's super low right now. To the point where mm-hmm. I'm intrigued in bidding on this now, not just <laughs> potentially to win it, but to give myself one win out of these three. Yeah, uh, you're going to pad this thing. You're so going to pad this thing. Um, Sand, I, I, not only do you sandbag before I, we start, but you're going to actually bid on these things? Sheesh. So here's what's interesting to me is I feel bad because there was a sale. It was a PSA 810. It sold nine days after he won the U.S. Open for $32,400. I saw that too. And there was a didn't copy. Sway me. There was it didn't sway me either, but there was a copy that just sold about 48 hours ago in a BGS 910 and I think the evolution of our space creates more sophisticated buyers. And when I look at the 9 autograph on the PSA example, it is similar if not better than the 10 autograph on the BGS 9. The one thing the BGS 910 has going for it is the two color patch is evident. Now there's a sliver of some white in your example at PWCC that ends in less than a week, but this one is evident. It's flush. It sold for 11.4. So I came in under, Interesting. I'm at 8,400 okay. here. I think this is going to fall somewhere in between us. I really believe that. And if I'm bidding, it's probably going to go closer to where? Mm-hmm. Here we go. No. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So you don't want me bidding on your items? Of course. Of course. Of course. I would rather I would rather this go for a great number for the consigner yes. than, there we than go. for me to win. There we go. We'll we'll ultimately see what transpires here. But the cards that you picked this week for magic number have been fantastic. This is going to create, I think, a lot of buzz and a lot of wide ranging potential outcomes here. And when I look at some of these cards, right? Number to fifty copies, number to twenty five copies. Some of these are pretty rare, but there's another segment that we love doing that features rare cards, and it's Damn, That's a Ghost. Damn, that's a ghost! We're going to highlight a card that hasn't sold in more than a year right now, or is serial numbered to less than 100 copies produced. We're going to talk about why this card is significant, maybe in terms of hobbies or language or just the overall rarity of it all and why it's considered a ghost. The card that we're discussing today that's extremely rare is one that I love and I just have trouble figuring out why the player we're about to discuss is so undervalued when you think about the organization he played for, the guy he played with, his accolades, and that he continues to be in the limelight and on television virtually every single day. He's a brand ambassador. It shocks me. But the ghost card we're talking about is the 1997 Ultra Stars Gold Shaquille O'Neal in a BGS 9.5. Talk to us about this card, Jesse. Yeah, so you mentioned earlier in the pod that you know we've been throwing out these monster cards, um, and this one is it's a it's a great card. It's not a monster card. It should hit five figures, um, probably somewhere in the teens is where it'll finish, in my opinion. But um, it's a 1997 Ultra Stars Gold Shaquille O'Neal uh, in a Beckett 9.5 Gem Mint. So these are known to have a print run of only 100 copies. They're actually not serial numbered, but um, it's known there's only 100 that were made. And the reason this is a ghost is the last Beckett 9.5 to sell was in 2013. 
So it has been a minute. Uh, this is one of those cards that you know, someone was waiting for the market to tick up on Shaq. And I think it has a little bit. I think some of these older athletes um, are getting some shine. You know, you've seen Magic Johnson's cards do it better. Larry Bird's cards are doing better. Um, but when you look at Shaq, you know, he's one of the most dominant players to ever play the game. He's got four championships, 15 all-stars. He's got a fantastic brand. Like you mentioned, he's still very active on TNT, just signed a 10-year deal. Um, I just I don't understand why his stuff – isn't worth significantly more, especially because he won another championship when he left LA, right? So he's got four. Um, this card itself is only a pop five, so there's only five Beckett nine five examples that exist, and it's just a really aesthetically pleasing card. I love it, and you know, out of the hundred, the last thing I'll mention is out of the hundred, um, there's only been about thirty known examples to be graded between the three three major grading companies. So mm-hmm. it's the the actual supply is much lower than the the hundred that were were printed. This is really interesting because 90s inserts are right up my alley. In this specific one, it's gold, it's shiny, and really the reason sets and cards like this were created in the mid to late 90s is to specifically combat all of the overproduction from the late 80s and early 90s, and we commonly refer to that as the junk wax era. These cards were specifically designed to hold and grow in value because of the scarcity coupled with their beauty. And there's a couple cards like this where it's not serial numbered. The estimated print run is to 100. We see something similar, although this one is serial numbered in terms of the hoops bams and the slam bams. But based on the products, because they were lower end products, a lot of them got junked. So that's why we're seeing less cards graded than the estimated print run. And thinking about this card, on average, to pull this specific card, you would have to open nearly 2,900 packs. And Is that it? Yeah, that's 2, it. <laughs> well, I know you like to rip a lot, but I, th- I mean, I'm, you, I'm you, that might even wear you out. <laughs> that is well. If I told you how many packs of 2019 Fortnite I ripped with my kids, you'd probably you probably wouldn't talk to me again. Oh, scary, scary with the wine flowing. Palette, so, a palette. Really? I'm not kidding. Okay. Still getting... an extremely undervalued. <laughs> that's that's okay. I'm already calling the undervalued overvalued for the ne- for next week. It's going to be Panini Fortnite cards. Oh, oh let's goodness. Go. Oh, goodness. <laughs> when it, the, the thing about this card, too, and just kind of want to touch on this because I think it's really an interesting set. And there's some sets that are similar to it, but there's one thing that this has going for it as well, right? There's 20 players featured in this set. Mm-hmm. And it had Jordan, it had Kobe, it had Iverson. So... I prefer another set, the Fleer Brilliance 24 carat cards. They're serial numbered to just 24 copies. But Michael Jordan isn't in that set. Jordan is in the Ultra Stars gold set. And it creates that ability to say, if Jordan is worth X, then Shaq and other players have to be worth a percentage of that. And as Jordan's price grows, other players in this set have to grow with it. Yeah, you can always play the comparison game, right? And that's how... When you have a really rare asset, um, you have to figure out deltas for other sets, how it can compare to the specific set, and that's how you can determine pricing when you don't have any sales data. So I get it, yeah, but uh, the fact that this does have Jordan in it makes it that much more attractive of a set. And like I said, I'm looking at the card right now. It is, it's just really pretty. It looks like Shaq's about to take off and just dunk on somebody. Um, and he looks he looks pretty shredded in this thing. I kind he of is. forgot. <laughs> yeah, he looks, he looks great. <laughs> and the one thing my understanding is you're, you are a Lakers fan, correct? Yes, I okay. am a Lakers fan. I do not want to talk about the start to the no, season. No, all of, I all actually, of the basketball guys I talk to say that whether it's Kobe or Shaq, there's a little bit of a premium placed on the gold uniform within cards, oh, which this also percent. has going for it as well. Yes, he's got a Lakers uni on here, and there is an argument to be made. If you were to put Shaq on the Lakers right now, would the Lakers' three-point field goal percentage improve? It is so bad that it's possible. <sighs> 22 percent through three games it's not good bob team it's not good (laughs) not good speaking of some things that are potentially not good it's you and i battling over a segment that we like to call this or that 
So we doing this or we doing that? You tell me and we'll tell you. We're going to compare two cards right now with similar value that are completely different. Let me give you an example. Let's just say for argument's sake, you have a vintage Mickey Mantle baseball card worth $30,000. But you also have a modern day Joe Burrow rookie card worth 30 grand. Which one would you rather have and why? You tell us, we're gonna tell you right now. So you set up the cards this week, very similar to the inaugural episode that we did where there is just a large dichotomy between the two assets. In episode two, you made them a little bit similar. And yep. what's interesting about this is you know my vibe. I am a baseball guy. I'm a Yankees fan. The two cards we're going to discuss here, one being the 1951 Bowman Mickey Mantle rookie in a PSA two and a half, and its counterpart, the 2018 National <laughs> Treasures Stars Stripes Lamar Jackson rookie patch auto to 15 copies. I think you know where I'm going, so I'm going to let you lead. And which card would you rather have, Jesse? So the only way that I can make this an argument <laughs> is by talking short term. So I'm going to talk yes. short term. Okay. Well, I figured when you conjured uh, this up, you were going to go in a direction that I didn't think you were going to. You were going to zig when I thought you were zagging. Yeah. Look, I know what you're going to pick. But um, so look, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> try to soul. make a compelling. Ar- yeah, I know you are. I'll try to make a compelling argument for Lamar. So this this specific card, this 2018 uh, NT or National Treasure Stars and Stripes, it's numbered out of 15. There's only 15 copies that exist. This is a rookie. The autograph is on card. It is vertical, which is more appealing than horizontal. Uh, it just looks better when it's sitting in the graded holder that way. So what I really like about this card is it came from a product called First Off the Line, which um, they have more limited runs. It's the only place you can get this card in. Um, they were selling for a premium when they first came out when you had to open the boxes. And what I actually love about Lamar Jackson's um, cards and his rookies is that playing for the Ravens, they have a very, very cool looking patch uh, that is on their uniform, which makes for a lot of different colors in a patch. So looking at this card right now, uh, it is a five color patch. And I know there's there's uh, Ravens patches out there that have a little red in them as well, which would make it six colors. You got yellow, gold, black, purple, white, uh, gray. I mean, it's there's everything you can imagine basically for the patch on this card. And the 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 patch itself can create a massive premium for the card selling. Now, this is, I said, short-term play here, right? So you've got what we call a nasty patch. Um, he's coming off a pretty solid start to the year. I think the Ravens are four and three now. Yep. Um, yeah, they they um, only play uh, one top 10 defense the rest of the year, uh, from my understanding, and that is the Bucks. And actually... That might have changed since I after this weekend. <laughs> they might not be in the top ten anymore. I'd have to look. PJ Walker um, just shredded them. No, oh, just absolutely shredded them. Um, so timing on this card is going to be everything. You know, he he already has an MVP. Um, you know, they've got a great a great team in general. So for a short term play, I like this card. It sold earlier this month for eleven thousand dollars. And, you know, the, the 51 Bowman Mickey Mantle rookie in a PSA 2.5 sold earlier this month for 10500 So there's only a $500 difference in these two cards we're discussing. Um, but, you know, the, the Mantle is his true rookie. Um, we all know, you know, he is the staple New York Yankee, top 20 player all time, seven-time World Series winner, um, blue chip asset. This, this Mickey Mantle card is much less risky than Lamar Jackson, but I'm playing the short-term flip game here, and I'm going Lamar. Obviously, I'm going with the 1951 Bowman Mantle here, and I think what's interesting about that is going back to the top of this podcast and figuring out what type of collector you are. Obviously, some people can pump in a little bit more time energy and effort i'm a singles doubles hitter during football season i don't have time to play the flip game i'd much rather buy it and forget it and know that long term i'm going to be okay and so that's kind of why i gravitate towards the mickey mantle to your point this is the true rookie the 1951 bowman it is horizontal so people don't love that as much but it's got to start creeping up in price a little bit more relative to where the 1952 tops 
vertical card is selling for. So I do think there's both some upside and some protection as we navigate some choppy waters in all markets over the next 18 months. The one thing I will say, and it's very interesting, and you know, one of the episodes that we did talk about the synergy between both sports betting and cards, the one thing that you're going to have to help me understand, and maybe this is something where there's a group effort between PWCC and Bet the Board because you guys are always ahead of the curve with things. And again, they become adaptable and people just understand them years down the line. But in the gambling world, okay, if you're giving out information, you're giving out a game that you like, you are a fraud if you are not invested in that specific game yourself, if you're not going to battle with the guys you're giving that information to. Whereas in the card space... If you tell someone you own it and you think it's a good investment, they immediately tell you you're pumping the market. You're pumping. So we have to get the sports card space a little bit more knowledgeable with stuff like this. We need to see a little bit more evolution with that aspect of your market. Well, I think part of that, part of the reason for that is when you're betting on a sport, you can't affect the outcome of that game, right? When you're betting on sports. With trading cards, you're talking about potentially affecting the value of an asset because it's getting pumped. It's no similar to Jim Cramer talking about all the stocks that he's invested in when he's pumping stocks, right? So it is it is a little bit different, but um, I I am not a flipper either. I'm just making the argument here for Lamar. To be frank, um, I don't have any Lamar Jackson cards, but. I, if if I were to own, I'm going to be completely honest, there's about two quarterbacks that I would probably own that are, I would say their rookie years are 2017 to today. Uh, three quarterbacks, forgive me. Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, and Lamar Jackson. And I like Lamar as long as he can stay healthy. I think they have a really good team around him. I think he's got a shot to make a Super Bowl. Um, he's just so electric if he can stay healthy. He's really got a chance to do something special. Uh, like I said, he's already won an MVP too. So let's not let's not forget that, right? Yep. Um, let's but, see how they finish this, too. And I think to your correct. point, we've seen a touch of a pullback in the market since this, the first couple weeks. And mm-hmm. when you think about them being four and three, there are three losses. They've blown double-digit leads in each of I those know. three games, which is the unfortunate part. When you think about all the other teams kind of hanging around, it looks like Cincinnati's figured some things out offensively using Joe Burrow in more shotgun. So the offense is certainly surging a little bit. They haven't pulled away from the potential of Deshaun Watson returning late and taking the Browns on a little bit of a run. You would have liked that 7-0 and possibility here, but maybe that's created a touch of value in the market. Now, dealing with a little bit of a hip injury didn't look a hundred percent on sunday against the browns short week thursday night against the bucks on the road that'll be an interesting game but i'm still going with the mantle i'm a baseball guy i can't i know you are i i want just to finish my argument on lamar uh because it is a short-term play so i'm talking like selling when the playoffs start i'm assuming they're gonna have double digit wins because listen to this remaining schedule they've got a thursday night game so i got a short week this week against the bucks then they go at Saints, home against the Panthers, at Jaguars, at home against the Broncos, at the Steelers, at the Browns, home against the Falcons, home against the Steelers, and then they got the Bengals on the road to finish the season. That is a pretty cupcake schedule if I've seen one. I'm hoping they make the playoffs because we have an investment on the Baltimore Ravens to make the playoffs. We obviously got a little intel on how long that Deshaun Watson suspension would be and when they were him and his camp were pushing for six I just knew that wasn't a likely outcome so I am hopefully aligned with you in that the Baltimore Ravens make the playoffs and if someone is deciding to purchase some Lamar Jackson stuff they make the playoffs and it allows them to sell those assets I mean what that time they they've got to end up what 11 and six at the worst that's three more losses this year. So let's say let's say the Bucks figure it out this Thursday and they beat the Ravens. Okay, yep. so they're four and four. You're telling me, okay, they lose to the Bengals. I see them beating every other team they're going to play. To be honest, the Jaguars, the Saints, the Panthers, the Broncos, maybe the Browns when Deshaun Watson's back because that is December 18th and he should be back. So maybe a, 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 a shitty loss there or something. But man, it's just there is not there is not a tough schedule at all. It's just not tough. Okay. 
We're gonna we're gonna agree to disagree a little bit. I think it's tough Ooh. winning football games in this league. Doesn't matter who you play. I think the Jaguars are a little bit undervalued. They are winning on the field. They just haven't figured out how to win yet on the scoreboard. And hopefully that transformation happens a little bit. But again, you mentioned Deshaun Watson returning for one of those games against the Browns. Cincinnati's figured it out. There's some things we here just, that are very interesting. We just got a bullish Jaguars play here. That's that's interesting. I need well, to talk I, I, to you more about that off air. Talk talk about being unbiased, by the way, because this is a venting station on Sunday. Jaguars, Giants, one of our largest positions of the week was over 41 and a half. We, of course, beat the market as we traditionally do. It closed 44. There were nearly 900 yards of offense in that game. It landed 40 because the Jaguars had three trips inside the 20 that yielded a grand total of three points. Just an absolute travesty. Anything else before we wrap up episode three of Cardboard Chat, Jesse? That's all I got. Go Lamar. Make sure you follow Payne on Twitter at Payne Insider. Subscribe to Bet the Board and get notified when new episodes of Cardboard Chat air on Tuesdays. And be sure to stop by pwccmarketplace.com for all your collecting needs.